A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. At Miletus, Paul spoke to the presbyters of the church of Ephesus. Keep watch over yourselves and over the whole flock, of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers, in which you tend the church of God, that he acquired with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, and they will not spare the flock. And from your own group, men will come forward, perverting the truth, to draw the disciples away after them. So be vigilant and remember that for three years, night and day, I unceasingly admonished each of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to that gracious word of his that can build you up and give you the inheritance among, among all who are consecrated. I have never wanted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You know well that these very hands have served my needs and my companions. In every way I have shown you that by hard work of that sort, we must help the weak. And keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus, who himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt down and prayed with them all. They were all weeping loudly as they threw their arms around Paul and kissed him, for they were deeply distressed and that he had said that they would never see his face again. Then they escorted him to the ship. Verbum Domini. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Show forth, O God, your power, the power, O God, with which you took our part. For your temple in Jerusalem, let the kings bring you gifts. You kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, chant praise to the Lord, who rides on the heights of the ancient heavens. Behold, his voice resounds, the voice of power. Confess the power of God. Over Israel is his majesty. His power is in the skies. Awesome and in his sanctuary is God, the God of Israel. He gives power and strength to his people. himself lowly, becoming like this child, he is of greatest importance in the heavenly reign. Lexio Sancte Evangelium Secundum Ioannem. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, Holy Father, keep them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I protected them in your name that you gave me. And I guarded them, and none of them was lost, except the son of destruction, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. 
but now I'm coming to you. I speak this in the world so that they may share my joy completely. I gave them your word, and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world. Do not, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Consecrate them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I send them into the world, and I consecrate myself for them, so that they also may be consecrated in truth. Erbum Domine. Laus tibi Christe. Today we have Jesus' high priestly prayer, we call it, in John's Gospel. And he's, to, he's praying for the apostles, uh, for their unity and their mission. And we don't have it today, but the next verses speak about he's also praying for all those who will believe in him through their words. So this was the night before he was to die. He's about to be taken by the temple guards. So it gives a, a great infant emphasis on these words, the importance of what he's saying. And he's praying to his heavenly Father, and he says, Father, keep them in your name so that they may be one just as we are one. And he comes back to that, that theme, this theme of unity. And we see that the church's unity is a sharing in the very unity of the Trinity. We speak of this unity of, of love as, as the word we use is communion. So they are called to have the same communion that the Trinity has. It's supposed to be a participation in that communion of the Trinity. It's a sharing in that. And we're not to think of this as something added to the church, that, oh yeah, you're supposed to be unified. But this communion expresses the church's very mission. It is her essence, that she is not a, real, a reality closed in on herself, she is sent to gather the nations to make present and spread the mystery of communion, this mystery of the very trinity itself that the church participates in is supposed to make it real here on earth, to even concretize it, we could say, and to call all into this unity. Another way to say this is Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God, that Jesus comes in the Synoptic Gospels proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand, and this is God's reign. His reign has begun. It's inaugurated with the coming of Christ in this new way that Jesus has become one of us. That kingdom is found in him. And that kingdom which he begins here on earth is fulfilled in heaven. So Jesus says, as you are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. That, you know, that they, that we're inserted into that Trinitarian life through Jesus. That through the reign of God, through this kingdom he's begun, we are sharing, have this participation in, uh, in the very mystery of the Trinity. So as you sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. He sends these apostles out to proclaim this communion, to proclaim this gospel that unites. This communion is the Father's plan for us, and it's bestowed on us, it happens through Christ, that we're united in and through Christ, and that the church is the calling together of this communion. He says, when I am lifted up on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. I will draw all to myself. This gathering is the church. It's the establishment of this communion. So he consecrates them, uh, the apostles, he consecrates them in the truth. And your word is truth, he says. Now consecrate means 
to separate or to take out of the world, to give over to God, to set apart, you know, out of the world, to set apart, to set aside for God. It means to immerse one in God, that a person who is consecrated is given over to God in a special way. And God alone is the Holy One. He is holiness itself. He is pure light, goodness, and truth. Holiness describes his unique nature. So to consecrate them in truth, to set them apart for God, is to immerse them into the very life of God, who is holiness itself. So we speak of consecration as a sanctification, this giving over to God. And in the Old Testament, uh, this consecration is used to describe priestly ordination. So this is Jesus' high priestly prayer, and he is establishing or making known his priesthood. He says, I consecrate myself. So this is a priestly act. He's giving himself, setting himself apart over to the, giving himself to the Father. We speak of his Passover as his passing over to the Father. So he belongs, of course, as the Son to the Father completely and totally. And that if we look at it, his priesthood, we say that he is a priest and a victim. He's setting himself apart in sacrifice in order to be offered to his heavenly Father. So he's offering himself as priest, giving himself to the Father. Now, in the new covenant that Jesus establishes, there is only one priesthood, the priesthood of Jesus Christ. It has its ministers that he's speaking to today, the apostles. His ministers share in that one, in his one priesthood. It's a participation. So to consecrate them in truth, and your word is truth, means to, that they're inserted into his priesthood, into his life. So Jesus is the word. And the word, as he, as he proclaims himself, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, to consecrate them in truth is to set them apart into his life, into his offering as priest. So I consecrate myself for them so that they also may be consecrated in truth. So they're taken up into his priest, his offering to the Father. As I mentioned, that cross is the way this communion is established. When he is lifted up, he's drawing everyone to himself. And then he sends them out in this prayer. He prays that they may be sent out into the world to proclaim this truth and to teach the gospel, to teach his words. That's going to entail also administering the sacraments, especially baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist, which is the representation of this cross through which we have this communion, this unity, and to shepherd or to govern the church, to guide this church. So through these three actions of proclamation, preaching, teaching, administering the sacraments, governing the church, they are going to form the communion of the church. We're gonna have a visible aspect there's an institutional aspect to the church of the invisible communion that is there through a Trinitarian life. That's a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> but everyone, the baptized laity, participate in that. You share in the priesthood of Christ as well to serve that communion, to foster that communion. You are to witness uh, to the truth with your lives and at times to proclaim it. And of course, to live a sacramental life, you know, to come to Mass, at least on Sundays, you know, to go to confession, to, to repent and to receive that grace, to be transformed into his life, to be members of his body, to be consecrated in him, that we all may be one as they are, as the Trinity is one, so that all may believe through their words. This is you know, absolutely necessary for the world to believe. If we don't have this communion, it's not, we're not witnessing in a truthful way, because that's the reality of the church. If we don't have that communion, on one level, we just don't draw anybody, because nobody wants what we have. 
but it's the it's a precondition. It's the it's the only thing that that gives uh, veracity to our words. You know, if people see that and experience that, more importantly, experience that communion. May we be faithful to that in serving that communion through our lives, through our good works, uh, through our own witness, witness to this communion that Jesus offers us in the church.